This introduction into QPath with a special focus on analyzing multiplex fluorescence images. QPath is a tool for quantitative pathology. It's open source and it's free. It's very good in handling big data files and also in creating annotations. There are a lot of features that I will not talk about today. For example, um, you can analyze colored images like classical histological stains like H&E, h and -E, you can also do like selection of special regions and create the measurements there. And you can also automate workflows in quite complex uh, Groovy scripts. So that's a Java-based scripting language. If you use it, make sure to also cite it. And here's a publication that you can use for that. The data that I based this introduction on is a multiplex fluorescence data set. So meaning we have uh, 10 channels, and out of these one, uh, and the nuclei stay in the DAPI, so this is a, from a tissue core, from a tumor tissue. And then we have eight markers that uh, characterize the cells. So meaning for each cell, like the absence or presence of these markers characterize the class of the cells. And then what we are interested in is identifying the cells and classifying the cells, counting them, and additionally, I also would like to detect blood vessels in this tissue. I want to point out that especially the three first steps, they are quite close to a workflow that is in the QPAD documentation. And I will also add a link in the description of this recording. So I have QPAD already open and uh, I've done nothing else. The first thing that you need to do when you start now a new image analysis project is to really create a project. So um, we do this here on the file project, create project. to now import an image into our project. What we can do is just take the image and just drag and drop it on QPath. So in our case, um, what we need to do is to set the image type. We have a multiplex fluorescence image, so we want to pick here fluorescence under the image type. And then we can already click on import. So the, the image will stay in its original position and just inside the project will be just information of where QPAD can find your image. To work with the image, what you need to do is to activate it. So you double click on it. And then you can see now the tissue core and you can simply zoom into it by scrolling or with your mouse wheel. You can pan it and move it around. And you can also watch at the, uh, look at the single channels. So I went to view, brightness and contrast. We can see here now are the different channels that came from the image data. So you can see we have um, in total 10 channels where of which nine are with a specific information. What I also like to do is to switch to grayscale here, because with that you can inspect now the single channels more easily. So you, you will see the DAPI channel and then these different markers. Then of course, you who've done the experiment, you know what's behind uh, the, like which is the marker behind the specific dye. What you then should do or what is convenient to do is to rename the channels. So instead of having Opal 480, you should really have the channel information like the marker. So for that data set, I have this in a, in a short text file, for example. And then I would know that um, in the second channel, which is now the Opal 480, I have a marker that is called IVA1. And I could now double click here and say, I would like to rename now my channel to IVA1. And in theory, I could also change the lookup tables. We haven't looked at the 
colored channels and with using lookup tables. Um, so now the signal will be shown in this bluish lookup table, cyan lookup table, and then you could also change that. But for now, we are changing only the name and press apply. And just to show you also now this channel in the bluish lookup table, we could switch off the show grayscale, go here and uh, inspect this channel. So it's now renamed. And in theory now we should do this for each single channel. So for every channel, we would like to rename it to the marker that was used or that was detected in that channel. We can do this one by one, or you could also prepare a little script just to already show you that you can automate a few things. So that I prepared a, a Groovy script. I call it rename channels. I also just drag and drop it. After drag and dropping, you can see that the script automatically opens up in the script editor. And this is a super short script, right? It's only one command. But what it does is when we run it, it automatically then renames all the channels to your kind of desired channel names. So we can go to run and run this little script. Then in theory, we can already close it because we can see here that now the channels have the proper marker name. In the next step, what I would like to do is now annotate an area which, in which I would like to detect cells. So um, in this case, what I want to do is to simply annotate the entire core so I can draw a circular selection annotation. And that's it. But uh, often you have a bit of like tissue that is a bit destroyed or necrotic. And then you want to do more fancy annotations. And I want to point out that uh, doing making annotations is really nice and convenient in QPath. And if you want to do that a lot, you want to annotate a lot of data, then you should really check out the documentation on how, on how to easily um, select areas in the image. So the next thing I would like to do is to detect cells. There's one command in QPath that is called cell detection, but there's a command search bar that you can open using uh, on, on a Windows computer, Control and L. So you can find in the command list and then start typing what you're searching for. So we are looking for cell detection and this is here. So we execute that command by just double clicking on it. And then we go to the cell detection dialog menu. And basically the crucial parameter to change here is this threshold. So how do you find a good threshold? So one way what you could do is um, to zoom in and to check a bit the intensity of your, of your nuclei. So the cell detection works using the DAPI channel, so using the nuclei as, as information. And then here in this lower right corner, what you can see is the position where you are with the cursor, and then also the pixel gray value that you are hovering over. So if we are somewhere in the background, we see this is a background corrected image. So it's a gray value of zero. And if we hover over the nuclei, we see a value of 4.7 in this case, or here it would, should be, of course, a bit different from nucleus to nucleus. So we could uh, try, I tried it of course out before and I, I uh, thought uh, the threshold of, of two is good to also pick these uh, bit darker nuclei. And then um, the rest you could keep constant for your first trial. So we press run and if you are trying out something, then actually it's good to run it on a smaller area. So for now, what I did was really selecting the entire core with a circular annotation and then mm, now running it. 
And as you could see, it took a few seconds, still very fast. But if you want to try out, you can uh, kind of uh, run it first on a smaller annotation. So let's see the result. Um, so we, what you can see here now is that the nuclei got detected and then cells are defined by simply expanding the nuclei region by um, five microns. So um, in theory, what you would like to check is, okay, uh, are separated nuclei really separated? And is a one big nucleus really detected as only one big nucleus and not as several? What we can see in this example is there are several nuclei a bit um, not detected, so they were too dim. No, our threshold here was too high, so we could try to repair it by lowering the threshold. Good, and I think that looks pretty good. So now even the dimmer cells could be detected. In general, this looks uh, quite promising. While you were detecting cells, um, then it already does a lot of measurements per cell. So we can look at it uh, in the hierarchy tab. So in the hierarchy, we can see we have one big annotation that was our circle. And then in, these, uh, in this annotation, it found now 5,284 cells. And we can open this drop-down menu and then we can inspect really each single cell. So we can double click on the cell to see which of these cells are we looking at, okay. And then you can also see that uh, uh, QPath is extracting a lot of measurements per cell while it is detecting it. So that is quite convenient. So let's have a look on these, on these measurements. So for that particular cell, for example, it tells us that the position of the center, the centroid in X and Y, the area of now the nucleus, so it gives some shape param par parameters of the nucleus, and then it gives intensity parameters of the nucleus, and the intensity parameters are really for each channel. So for example, it starts by giving you the mean intensity on the DAPI channel, then the mean intensity of the next channel, which was the IVA1 channel, and so on, until it, we really reached all the 10 channels. And then it does that, not only for the nucleus, but also for the entire cell, that would be the entire region, including the nucleus. And it does this also then for the cytoplasm, which is just the old outer band here. Then what you can also do at that point already is to look at measurements. So we can look at the annotation measurements. Again, one annotation in this case is the is our circle and or ellipse, let's say. And then in this case, you would just get how many cells were detected. And these were like these 5,000 something cells. And when we look at the detection measurements, this is a table listing then all the cells and all these measurements that we have so seen in this lower uh, left table here are now in the results table and then you can sort such a table by like let's say you would like to know you would sort it would like to sort it by the IBA1 mean signal and then what you can do is for example inspect now the cell that had an especially high value or especially high intensity in the IVA1 channel. So you can double click on it. And then again, while double clicking on it, QPath jumps to the right cell and outlines it in yellow. Let's have a look on the IVA1 channel in the cell. So we open our brightness and contrast command again. And then we could check now the IVA1 channel. And indeed that's a quite bright signal.
We have looked at this one cell and we've seen that it's IBA1 positive. It has a very high IBA1 intensity. And now we would like that QPath helps us in finding cells that are IBA1 positive or in general are positive or negative for given markers. So the first thing that I need to do for that is to tell QPath which classes I expect at all in my sample. And uh, I've reset it here now. So this looks more or less the list of possible classes now should look like what you would uh, expect when you do that the first time in QPath. And so there are classes that are not relevant now for our problem. But what we can do is to uh, go to these three dots and say we want to populate this class list from the image channels. And then I also don't want, in this case, to keep the existing available classes. So I have this list of classes. And now I could say for each cell, uh, for example, this cell now would belong to the IBA1 class because it's expressing the IBA1 marker. Good, but of course, uh, I would like that the QPath now helps me in doing this. So for each cell to tell me in, uh, whether it belongs to the IBA1 positive class or not. And I'm using um, the single measurement classifier for this. So um, what I'm doing here is to say, I would like to now filter um, for IBA1 measurements. And then uh, QPath already suggests me a lot of things while doing that. So it suggests me to look at the IBA1 mean intensity that was measured in the nucleus and determined by that measurement whether the cell is positive for IBA1 or not. In this case, the IBA1 signal is uh, also in, this, in the entire cell, expressed in the entire cell. So I can click on cell IBA1 mean as a measurement instead. And it also already automatically fills out that I expect then this cell to be to fall in the IBA1 class. And when I click on live preview, then I see those cells turning green. And I can play with threshold if I say I would like to uh, really only call cells that have a quite high a mean intensity of IBA1 positive. And I can play with the threshold and pick the only quite strongly positive cells. And once I'm happy with that, I can save that. And in this case, I tried this before, so I have already a classifier, but I click here, okay. Now we could do this for a second channel. So I would like to do all that uh, for, for a second marker. And then, so I would like to look at uh, our cells positive for a KI67, yes or no. Um, and so I switched to KI67 channel. And also here I'm picking that I'm, look, I want now to, to classify and filter for measurements in the KI67 channel. Let's have a look on a region that it really expresses K six, where we find cells expressing K67. And then um, also here it already kind of fills out automatically uh, what we could choose. And um, probably also here I would like to increase a bit the threshold. So now these cells are positive, these cells are negative. And of course you could do this. Uh, like observing the entire core and so on. But for demonstration, I say I'm happy with that and I save it. Okay. Then um, I can cancel all this and you see that we for, for now have just created these two classifiers, but I have not uh, applied them at all. And to apply them, I can go to again, classify object classification. And then I can load the object classifiers. So you see in this list that I have done a few more, but the ones that we just created was the IV1 and the K67. And then I can select them both by a control clicking them. And then I press on this apply classifier sequentially. And then you see that they turn on in different colors. So we have the single positive ones in green, the like IBA1 single positive in green, the K67 single positive in magenta, and then somewhere there would be also double positive cells.
if you uh, so what can for example happen is that the by default the two classes will have a similar color outline in this case it wasn't but then what you can do is to double click on a class name and also change the color of outline and then you can visualize the data in as you want to do it To inspect the result of the classification, um, there are several things that you could do. So you could, for example, open the mini viewers and show the channel viewer. And then uh, let's look at that cell that according to this lower right um, panel here should be a KI67 positive cell. And also, of course, according to the outline color. And then it should also be not IBA1 positive. And that is what we try to see here in this mini viewers. Now, this is a bit hard to do on the minded screen. But we do see, when we look carefully, we do see a signal in KI67, no signal in IBA1. There should be also double positive cells. How to find those? I like to go to the measurements and to the detection measurements. So again, this is the list of all the cells. And what it now has is a class. And we could have a look on, we can sort by class and then uh, look for cells that are double positive. And as you can see, there are really very few cells that are pos double positive. There are only these two cells and let's have a look on those. So we can double click here and check where is the yellow marked cell. And then we could, we see that it's, so now we are in the KI67 positive, uh, in the KI67 channel and they are positive, that looks good. Let's also have a look on the IBA1 signal. And here you can see that they are probably, these cells are most probably not IBA1 positive. So this is a misclassification and one way to deal with it would be, for example, to set the threshold e either higher or when we, in the very first step, when we did the cell detection, one could argue, yeah, maybe it depending, of course, on the entire sample, not only on these two cells, but there could be the reasoning that you should expand your cells, not as much as we did, like the five microns, because maybe that does not reflect the cells very well. What we also can do is to look at the annotation measurements. So this was detection measurements, and this is now the table giving the result for this one annotation, our little core, tissue core. And then we nicely can see, okay, there were these 5,284 cells detected. Out of those, 1,453 are IBO1 positive, two are double positive, and 32 are classified as KI67 positive. What I want to point out here is that you can also classify your cells by training object classifier. So when you're doing that, you're annotating a few cells, whether they belong to a class and a few cells that do not belong to that class. And then QPath automatically extracts measurements and these can be more than a single measurement to then determine whether the cells or like all cells belong to this class or not. So what I would like to show you now is how to create selections by using a pixel classifier. So what we've seen before was you can classify objects, which are the cells, but you can also classify single pixels. And I do that by going to classify pixel classification and then the create threshold menu. And in this example, what I want to do is to create selections of blood vessels. So what we are looking at here is the CD34 channel. And so I want to set a threshold on the signal of the CD34 channel. So I pick here as a channel, the CD34. And then I also tell QPath that every pixel that is above a given threshold, which with, uh, we will place there with, 
uh, I want to give this these pixels a class name, and I here pick the CD34 class. And then what you can do now is to play with this threshold and increase it. And then you can see that slowly, slowly, <laughs> like a really only pixels or uh, groups, regions where signal is are uh, detected or uh, marked as being above the threshold. Um, so you can see kind of a core selection and that comes uh, from this resolution here. So what the QPass does is basically to downsample the image and then use what one of these kind of big downsampled pixels uh, to set the threshold on. And that has the advantage that it's faster. And sometimes also you don't want so much data, so that can be even good to do. But um, you can play around a bit what happens if you increase the resolution. So in this example here, the uh, um, data set is not so big, so we can use a higher resolution. And then what you can um, also then have a look on is, okay, when we increase now the threshold a bit further, um, then we get kind of more detailed uh, selections of our vessels. We can also do a bit of smoothing and then we should get quite smooth outlines of our vessels. So if we are more or less happy with that, then uh, we can save this. So I like to call them with an the underscore pixel to know that this is a pixel classifier, not an object classifier. And I've tried this before, but I'm overwriting what I had before. And then for now, we just create the classifier. And the next step, what we would do is to now create objects. So I, I pick here the current selections after clicking on create objects. And the current selection is my selection of my core. So that is fine. And then what I want to do is to really split the objects. It means we will get a selection for each of these uh, of, of the vessel objects here. And then what you can also do is to say, uh, I want to exclude, for example, if you don't uh, think that this little object here should be then create like converted to a selection, then you can play with the minimum object size. So maybe here, 50 square microns would be a good value. And we'll also um, fill holes. Uh, in this case, I will put this to, to zero. And once we close this window, then we can nicely see the outlines. And as you see there, like now, um, these vessels are surrounded, but I exclude these little ones and then of, because so they are excluded now by size. And that of course depends on the project of whether you would like to exclude them or, or not. And what you can also do is to click on such an annotation it's a bit hard because what we are often clicking on are the overlying um, cells. But so this is an annotation here with a vessel. And then we could also have a look on what is the size. So this is, for example, 550 around uh, square microns big. That means uh, if you want to rerun this classification, creating only, like leaving only kind of clear big structures, then you, you would know kind of now what would be the minimum size that you want to enter. So now we've detected vessels. And then let's turn on again the cells. And we can do several things here now. So what we could do is to say, I would like to know um, which cells belong to which vessel. And then there's a command that is called resolve hierarchy. Uh, it will, if you have a very huge tissue with a lot of cells, this can take a long time. But let's say for this core, this is uh, still very fast. So this already uh, happened now. And then we can go, uh, so the advantage of doing this is when we now, um, for example, um, go to the hierarchy, then we can see like for each vessel object, for example, for this one, then we see, okay, there was one cell that was really overlaying 
this vessel like a kind of in the same spot as the vessel, which is probably this one cell here. Yes. And um, you can, this is also reflected in the measurements. So if we now show the annotation measurements, then we see for each vessel, we get an annotation. You can see this by the name. There's also the original round core annotation, but uh, this has a different name and class. So this would be an, a vessel annotation here. And then you could see, okay, there are four cells um, like inside the region of this vessel. And you can also again, click on this, have a look on that vessel. So these are then these four cells that are counted. So final aspect that I want to point out here is that for now for that uh, CD34 channel, really setting a simple threshold was enough to classify our cells. There's also more advanced uh, pixel classification. So also what is, let's say, standard by standard called pixel classification. And you can open this by train a pixel classifier. And if you know Elastic, then you know what this is doing. So um, what you do in a classical pixel classifier is that you annotate like pixels that are of certain classes. And then um, the, the classifier uses filtered versions of your image to decide whether a pixel belongs to a certain class or not. Meaning with this uh, pixel classifier window, you can create much more complex classifier that takes much more information into account for the decision of the class of a pixel. So that is worth checking out. Now that we have the cells of different classes and we have the vessels, we would like to know the distance of each cell to the closest vessel. So here's the closest, uh, here's a vessel. And then basically I would like to know the distance of the cells uh, to that vessel here. And then there's under analyze spatial analysis, there's the command distance to annotation 2D. And here what we, I say, yes. And then for each cell, you will see the distance to the closest vessel annotation. So for example, if we click on that cell, then we can have a look on our list of measurements. This is are all the measurements uh, that were automatically created in the very beginning when we did the cell detection. And then when we scroll to the very uh, bottom of the list, then we can see this last measurement. And that's kind of a new measurement now, which is the distance of the cell to the Next annotation of a, like a CD34 positive vessel annotation. And here, this is uh, 13, around 13 microns. And then of course, for example, this cell should be further away. So indeed, this is uh, 23 microns away. If we go to the uh, measurements, show detection measurements, then what you could do is, um, of course, you can save this again and analyze what is the average distance from a vessel of cells of this class compared to the average distance of cells of another class. And then you can see, okay, uh, is a certain cell, cell type closer to the vessels than other cell types. So here you can see in the last column now, this new measurement distance to annotation. Another spatial method that I find very useful is um, again here under analyze spatial analysis now, the uh, centroid distances. Again, I click yes here, added new measurements for each of the cells. So here we have the old new one, which is the distance to the vessels. And then we get for each cell, the distance to cells of other classes. So for example, here we can see that this marked cell here, the yellow one is uh, 40 microns away, 42 microns away from the next IV1 cell. And it's 47 microns away from a KA67 positive cell. You can export the outlines of the cells and of the annotations here under file object data export as GeoJSON. So you'd say, okay, I want to export all the objects and you can click pretty JSON. A JSON format 
It is a format that can then be easily opened in other software. Then, especially if you collaborate with like uh, bioimage analysts, a good format for them to continue analyzing your data.